All right, we're live. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy to be here again for this is the third edition of the Shape Up live stream. And uh, I've got Jim from Coffee Meets Bagel here with us today. So thanks a lot for joining us, Jim. Yes, thanks, Ryan. It's an honor. Uh, looking forward to uh, to doing another one of these. I always feel like we learn a lot. Um, I get to learn about the context uh, like that you're in. And then also usually some questions come up that that I've never faced before. And then it gives an opportunity to see everything from a new angle. So I'm always, always excited to do this. Um, I think we'll start off just with some background. And uh, maybe, Jim, you can tell us about kind of uh, what you're doing at Coffee Meets Bagel and what were some of the what were some of the struggles you were facing that kind of led you down the path of eventually giving shape up a try? Yeah, absolutely. So, so just a, a little bit uh, about myself. So, I joined the company five and a half years ago, a uh, much smaller team back then. So, this would have been a few months after they launched uh, the Android application, and uh, just after the Shark Tank episode aired, that sort of launched. Oh, they started a Shark Tank. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, and, cool. so, so uh, uh, the the company was founded in 2012. So the iOS app had several years, uh, uh, you know, of of running before before I joined. And uh, at that point, uh, the the teams were all functional based, right? So we had an Android team, an iOS team, a back end team. Uh, just sticking to the engineering portion here, hmm. and. Uh, Essentially, we were we were agile. We ran uh, sprints, two week sprints on the clients, more frequently on the on the back end. And uh, uh, you know, some of the things we were seeing back then uh, were that there was sort of a, a essentially the project uh, product manager would sit with each team to do the sprint planning. Each team had their own mm. boards, their own backlogs, uh, you know, their own sprint process. And uh, and also their own priorities, both internal and from external stakeholders, right? So there are a and lot. And what of... was the what was the role that you had when you came in at this point? Yeah, so I, I joined on the iOS team. Uh, there were only two of us. There wasn't really a, a hierarchy at that point. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you know, so it was it was fairly flat. And uh, uh, but were you but all as... were you more on the technical side or the the design side or kind of what? How did you come in? Like in terms of just your contribution. Uh, all the whole time uh, has been on the engineering side, so the technical mm -hmm. side, iOS, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just I just wanted to quick also the uh, you mentioned these different functional teams that you had like iOS team, Android team, and you had like a back end programming team. Uh, was there what, did you have any designers or how did design fit into this picture? Right. So so uh, for for the longest time, design. Uh, has been sort of like the the resource that's been uh, spread thin throughout the company, mm. right? And so essentially design was uh, sort of this shared resource amongst all of the projects, especially at that point, started, when I started. Um, we're talking about one designer at that point, uh, you know, for every everything we're doing, very small team, right? I, I, I wonder, do you, do you, I just, sorry, like, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, I keep hearing this from, from other teams. Like design was the, was the one thing we only had one of, or it was this like super like scarce resource, you know, did you, do you, do you have any sense of like why, uh, sorry to sidetrack, but like, do you have any <laughs> sense of like why that is or, or what's going on with that? I, you know what? I, I think at different phases uh, of a company's life cycle, they look for different things. Right. And I, I think because of the, you know, uh, the the resource constraints, the limited team, we've always expected more of our designers. So our designers are not just designing; they're also doing the the user uh, user testing, usability testing, the research, the uh, user research, understanding the user problem. They're they're kind of in that role, and they take over. I see more, more of a strategy position as well. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh huh. Yep. Okay, so so you join the team, and there's this kind of agile thing happening, and each of the different functional teams has their own boards, and then there's a kind of roving product manager. You said, yeah, and and so so that becomes the challenge, right? So each functional team has their own priorities, their own initiatives from things that have been asked of them, and then the the uh, product manager is trying to kind of string all these things together, and and help help us get aligned right so that uh especially for a cross-functional project and that that's really where we saw the challenges at that point where we've got these cross-functional initiatives how do we get them going so say mm. say it you know the the there's a back-end component here 
the backend team is able to work on it. So they work for maybe it takes a week or two, right? And and they move on to something else. Maybe iOS and Android at that point were still working on other projects. So mm -hmm. backend is ahead. Now they've been allocated to some other project. Uh, by the time the clients actually start working on it, maybe we run into an integration problem, right? Uh, and then it's like, how do we get the, this uh, person this back? The, this is the calendar Tetris thing. Yes, we're like yes. everything. Uh huh. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly that. And I, you know, uh, I, I think there were there were other aspects at play here. Just from, uh, um, it was hard to have a, a cross a cross functional team, a unified objective. Mm. Like that that was the thing that was uh, really missing there. And you know, even even being on the IC side, you know, it, you you kind of run into that. Am I am I just taking tasks off a board and and executing them, or am I kind of owning this thing? Uh, you know, for for longer than an iteration, right? Mm. And so, uh, in order to sort of uh, uh, you know empower more ownership to projects, it was uh, we knew we knew we kind of had to evolve. That's a really interesting distinction, like tasks on the board versus owning this thing. Yeah. Like, and so I, I'm guessing like kind of owning it means I don't just do the things that have somebody else lined up for me to do, but I'm actually going to kind of figure out what needs to get done next. And I'm going to take some initiative in terms of figuring out like how to connect the dots so that this thing is whole. Yeah. And well, and, and I guess that's sort of the, uh, the, the difference between, uh, you know, output and out, outcome. Right. And mm -hmm. so like getting mm -hmm. people focused on the outcome so, mm. so that like, if this didn't have the desired out outcome, are we learning from it? Are we reapplying it to the, you know, to the next at bat? Right. Um, yeah. Totally. Okay. So, um, okay. So I can get how um, this sounds a little bit like difficult, you know, for example, to deal with like backend has already moved on to something else, but now we ran into an issue and like, how do we coordinate all this? Um, but um where when did you have the first thought that like maybe we should do something different right okay so uh let, let's just say you know the the team uh the team grew and the dynamics kept growing and changing as we were onboarding more people and figuring out how how are we scaling not only our our team but our processes along the way and and so there was uh before we get to sort of the next big jump there was also this notion of when larger Harrier projects came up. Okay, we need a cross-functional team. We need people that are, are kind of focused on this longer running uh, initiative, which may be several months, right? Mm -hmm. And so we bring folks together in this sort of quasi cross-functional pod, but even there, uh, uh, based on uh, you know the, the the knowledge base of the individual people within the company and the the priorities and fires to put out as all startups are facing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, people would get swapped in and out along the way and they, we'd lose momentum, we'd lose context uh -huh. and you know, it, they weren't stable teams at that point. Mm. So the big shift really came in, uh, 2018 and in spite, like seeing that cross-functional model and saying like, there's gotta be something here where if we can align people around common objectives to move projects forward, and inspired by the the Spotify squad model, yep. uh, we we started coming up with okay, well, what are we looking for in the the next version of a cross functional uh, team? And we identified some characteristics there. So things like let's align them around a common objective. So for that, it was KPIs, right? So they had a north star, uh, you know, KPI that was driving their specific cross functional team. It was. Uh, less reduced dependencies between teams, right? So that they can function more autonomously, more independently. Right. They own the life cycle of their projects. They're able to continue uh, iterating on them. Um, yeah, so, uh, so so that was kind of the, the, the thought process going into these new cross-functional uh, pods. As how, did the, um, how did the space appear? How do you make that switch from being kind of in the work of like you're trying to get something released or you're trying to get something built to kind of on the work of like, how are we going to do this differently in the next project? Like where did something happen in terms of the cadence of the company where this like window appeared to actually look at the meta level of like, how are we doing things and how are we going to change this? 
pain is a great driver <laughs> of evolution, <laughs> right? You like, uh, you know, you 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 start enough initiatives, you 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 build up a, enough uh, uh, pain along the way to say, you know, there there's some aspects of this that just need to change. We've got to evolve past this. We get, we have to find things that are working as as the team's growing. How can we how, how can we work more efficiently, and how can we, you, you know drive more successful projects, right? Uh, so many of them, I mean, uh, you reading the beginning of Shape Up, the introduction, it's like going through that, it's like a checklist of, yeah, no end in sight, uh, no visibility by stakeholders and uh, on and on, exactly what we were running into there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so it just gets bad enough that you're like, I don't care, like, I'm just gonna have to make time to, to solve this. So I, I think that's where uh, myself and a few others within the company that, you know, we'd have discussions on this of like, how can we improve this? And it was really sort of a grassroots effort to, to try to adapt the, you know, how we work. Did you have ideas of how to like, is this the kind of thing that you like shop for? You know what I mean? Is it like we need to we need to go shopping around for methodology or is it the kind of thing where it just it's hurting, but then like you get lucky and something crosses your path and you go, oh, maybe we could try that. You know, it's not too different than uh, uh, other engineering problems, right? Where you identify things that are uh, bottlenecks or weird dependencies that just don't seem right. And you start thinking about like, does it have to be this way? What other mm -hmm. ways could this look like? And mm -hmm. honestly, the, the things that really were really started percolating in my mind around the cross-functional pods is when uh, a teammate shared with me uh, videos relating to the Spotify model and, yeah. and their ideal and how, how they were uh, intended to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see the Spotify model, what happens next? Yeah, so um, there were several of us that got together at the time. Uh, so uh, just the the leads between each of the platforms and the, the product manager, and we'd sit down and we'd talk about essentially uh, you know, there, there's a danger anytime you take a, a framework or a process or a, uh, off the shelf and just say, you know, we're just going to, you know, go whole hog into this thing and hopefully it turns out great. But likely yeah. there's characteristics about uh, the way you work in your company that you've got to adapt it to. And so we want to be very careful about that. Um, similarly, for anybody within the company, anytime you're making an organizational shift like that of how people work. Uh, you know, you, you've got to be very cognizant about the disruption that can cause. Yeah. And um, yeah. And, and so uh, we started meeting and we started building a plan around this. And, and also, um, you talk a lot about capping your downside, right? And, and especially when it comes to uh, shaping, we were trying to apply the same things uh, when, we, when we began to roll this out. And so, okay, we're just going to start off and uh, let's focus on you know two areas where we want teams to own these. Um, at, at the time, it was revenue and growth. Let's mm -hmm. have two two focuses there, and then let's learn from it. Let's see what it is. And even if this uh, isn't the answer for us, it's it's better than what we've got, and it's it leads us on the path of that learning. Got it. Mm -hmm. So okay, so you start with so so like what. You 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 try you tr you pilot a couple a couple of these teams these cross functional mm -hmm. teams and then uh, and then where does it go from there? Right. So so then you would think uh, uh, that uh, so with that you know if we're living up to the like the objectives uh, of you know autonomous fast moving teams that are moving independently like uh, sort of the shell of that made sense and it it helped align folks. But then you start looking at some of the the uh, inner parts of that, right? And and what what's not working there? Then it became uh, then it became a problem of our like what we when in shape up when you talk about shaping the work, uh, are we shaping things correctly so that there's an end in sight, right? Mm. Or are these just kind of drifting on and have super long tails to reach some conclusions? And how are we deciding these things? Um, and, and, and similarly, uh, you know, there, there's other problems at play. When, when you have a small team and you build out two cross-functional pods and you say, you've got narrow focuses, here's your KPI, you're following it, there's a big, it's a big product. Everything else that falls outside of the purview of, the, of those two teams 
then kind of falls on the back end, or, sorry, not the back end, the platform as a catch all. So there's uh -huh. a platform team involved. And, and then uh, the platform team ends up just taking on the other product work, right? Uh, but they, but there's, no, uh, um, there's no designated designer or cross-functional collaborators. So then we run back into the same functional model. How do we get the resources and the alignment uh, uh, you know, to make these things happen? Um, uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. So it sort of shifted, but then we were seeing flashbacks to the functional model going on. Interesting. So you've got some cross-functional teams, but somehow they're not centered around the right work. Well, or, I mean, the, the right work becomes sort of a matter of uh, priority, priorities, right? And uh, uh, it, it's, it's hard to say, like, well, either way, you know, from a, a user's perspective, they want to see the app evolve, right? And, and with, like the narrower focuses, they're not necessarily going to see those changes on the, like throughout the app. There may be aspects of it that improve, mm. but how do we get a, like a holistic view of change? And I guess that's the other piece. How do you that's handle so changes that span the app? That's so interesting. It's kind of a contradiction. It's like you, you tried to become more collaborative by creating these pods, but then you actually became more specialized. Yes, yes, exactly that. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh huh. Okay. And um, were you were you kind of um, consciously aware of the fact that like okay this still isn't working and we need to do something different or was it or like was it again kind of like that something like shape up like came across your just came across your desk and then thought oh maybe this can help. So uh, the whole the whole uh, thought process along with what I like our, our cross functional pods at this point uh, were that they'd be. There, there'd be feedback loops along the way so that they would evolve and improve. And I think there were aspects of that where the learning wasn't happening fast enough for us mm. to, to figure out solutions to these things, right? And so mm. uh, I, I think it's like, well, you know, we're tinkering. We, we, we'll, let's try this. Let's see if this, this helps. And at, at some point you think that, uh, again, uh, maybe there's like a holistic change or a way of thinking that we need to shift here that better embodies what we're trying to do because we're trying to do something uh and and this doesn't cover it mm -hmm. yeah and whatever it need, whatever it is it needs to be more of a step change instead of kind of yes. a little tweaking on the edges yeah we're not going to optimize our way out of this one uh-huh okay yeah okay so then what happens next Right. So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, just to put this in, into context, like I've, I've been following uh, uh, the philosophies of Basecamp for a long time now. And so um, I, I had read a lot of the works and I was paying attention for when, you know, Shape Up was announced. And, and there were glimpses of this in, in previous work talking about like how, you know, how you work at Basecamp. Mm -hmm. And so when that came out, uh, it, it seemed like, well, maybe it holds... Uh, aspects of evolution that can be applied, you know, to this. And then, mm -hmm. you know, just opening up, like I said, with the introduction, it was like, yes, we're still facing these same things that are, that are listed here that we were facing a, a while ago. Uh, and then, and then it was exploring further and, and thinking, ah, again, like an engineering problem, th that's how they're solving this dependency. And that's how they're, they're enabling these teams to move more quickly. And, you know, uh, so, so there was a lot of insights then that came out of that. I like um, that you frame it. I really like that you frame it as kind of an engineering problem because I think that's also how we look at it. Like uh, Jason and David have this thing where they sometimes say that like your product, your your bit, your company is your best product, right? <laughs> and and I always feel like like that's kind of the mentality of like how do we sort of debug? How do we like think about like the dis like refactoring the company or or mm -hmm. like re-engineering or like how do we orthogonalize like some piece of the way that we work just like you would like factor out some aspect of like the code that's tangled together right and that's and, and that's where like the, the the danger lies is that these are every time you're talking about detangling or moving like these are people and you you like uh yeah you want to be empathetic towards their perspectives and what they're going through and and how yeah. And, and how your changes, like at a high level, oh, why don't we just move this over here? Well, what, how does that affect the people doing the work at that point? Totally, totally, yeah. And so so uh, just just picking up from there, th this was a similar sort of grassroots effort of, uh, you know, talking about the ideas and and how uh, ShapeUp solves these different aspects 
and and sort of like selling it up and 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 trying to get buy-in uh, from from other team members and executives. And uh, just to call out, like like that's one thing that I really appreciate about working uh, at Coffee Meets Bagel is that they've been really supportive of this. Like the mm. you know all along the way, growth like personal growth is a uh, is a key quality of ours and the the growth of the like figuring out how to improve the company is something they've all been always been very receptive to That's so awesome. having an environment where we can actually try these things out um has been a great experience yeah yeah when you opened the book you mentioned that you kind of the 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 description of a problem resonated in the intro what did you see on the solution side that made you think like oh this actually might be something that we could use or this is something that seems like something that that we can do Right. And, and so, so that's, that's what I think it is. It's, um, if, if you imagine shape up being torn down into, uh, uh, like components, right. And then they were composed together to like, here's shape up, but actually there's a bunch of pieces here that could be used separately in, in yes. different areas. Uh, uh, so, so just the, like, like I mentioned before, just having a, a well-shaped idea before you start executing on it, like that would help, even if we if we change nothing else on the pot uh -huh. structure, but we just said, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're we're not going to begin work on this thing till it's well shaped, uh -huh. and then we're going to have an idea of when it ends, right? Similar uh -huh. to the appetites versus estimates, right? Like how much how long are we going to uh, give this thing uh, to come up with a solution? Because you know that that bit us in the past where projects just kept going, and either the more months you put in, the more unclear it becomes. Mm. Right, so mm -hmm. so they go outward rather than inward. Um, yeah, and and similar uh, similarly, like with uh, hill charts, you know, like uh, I, I remember there, there was a, there, there was a great talk about this at one of the GDC talks related to uh, Far Cry, and they talk about like their number one priority in development was like de-risk, de-risk, de-risk all mm. along the way, and so mm. that had been. Uh, you know, uh, like uh, bouncing around in my head uh, to take into account for each of these process, uh, you know, evolutions and the, the hill charts like uh, summarize it very well, where it's just like, what is the risk associated with this? At what point are we going from unknowns to knowns? And the, the other thing I really like about that aspect is Estimation has been a long-running topic in the uh, in the company. You know, as long as I've been there, how do we get better at estimates, and how do we improve this? And the estimates were wrong, and you know, and, and what are we going to do about this? And the yeah. whole, yeah, and it it summarizes that very well. Of like, there's task discovery. You're not going to know until you get started. Exact, like you can have the greatest plan, but it's until mm. you get started, you don't know for sure, and you don't really know what you're going to run into. Um. So th this is a long way of saying, uh, uh, at the end, uh, we were able to get buy-in uh, at, at the executive level and have a kickoff at the beginning of this year to enact shape up. And, uh, and yeah, what, but what did that mean? Like buy-in yeah. for what? Like, so, how did you, how did you shape what the adoption was going to be? Right. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, right. So, uh, being the, you know, the, the manager on the iOS team, uh, there, there's way more aspects going into play, uh, that, about how people work that I need to make sure, like I get their perspective on as well, just so I'm even framing the, like how this would work, uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. And so it, there was a lot of collaboration amongst the team to, to make this thing happen. And essentially what we'd say is, all right, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna start and we're gonna, we're gonna create a cycle at the beginning of the year. We're gonna, we're gonna try this out. We're gonna shape some ideas. Uh, and we're, we're going to follow through with the, the, the pitches, the betting, and we're, we're going to more, more than anything, because we don't really know yet, we're going to kind of follow the book as, mm. as much as possible. Right. So rather mm. than taking what we have and saying, now let's just kind of fit this in, we're going to say, all right, let's, let's just kind of, let's try this. Let's see what we learn out of this. And it, it's evolved over time. And certainly we've made mistakes and, and learned from it. But there are aspects that emerge from that uh, that, you know, harken back to uh, our previous uh, cross-functional pods. And then it becomes a question of evolution here, right? So there's a big focus still on uh, uh, North Star metrics, KPIs, and, and strategy teams 
that are, are focused on on those aspects. Mm -hmm. And and so and this is where we kind of dive into all the questions I have are around these aspects because yeah, it becomes like uh, uh, you know how how fungible are the the people working during the execution of these cycles and are they tied at all to the strategy teams or are the strategy teams kind of <laughs> just on the shaping side and you know th there's all different aspects so we can kind of uh, uh find our way in however uh however you like here yeah um maybe let's let's just do a, a short linking step um in terms of uh okay so um i uh, can you sort of give me a little bit of a sense of kind of what the org looks like post shape up? So like where, who, who's, who's shaping and who's creating pitches, who's on the betting table and then what, like what, who are you drawing from for build teams? Yeah. All right. So, uh, on the, on the shaping side, right. So we've got our, our, uh, product strategist, uh, that, that is design strategy, um, working with other, uh, you know, head of product and, um, essentially actually, you know, really each of the, uh, product managers kind of became shapers, uh, mm -hmm. in, in their, their own right here. So we essentially have, uh, shaping coming from the, the PM side and, mm -hmm. and design and, uh, those roles get kind of muddy, uh, you know, between the design and product. We, we have a, a lot of talented folks that are kind of doing multiple things there. And uh, that's it, cool it, to hear shaping coming out of PM because that's kind of our general tilt is that that product like product managers should actually go lean, lean more in the direction of designers rather than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, than uh, like, like sort of schedule wranglers you know, or, or aligners or something like that, because if, if they're sort of, uh, actually it's like sources of actual work rather than just a alignment and management and coordination, you know, mm -hmm. uh, then there's, then there's some skill and there's some domain expertise that's getting centered somewhere in the company there. So that's, yeah, that's, well, it's interesting to hear that happening. I, I think you're, I think you're going to find that there's other aspects to that though, uh, where we are also running into challenges uh, around, mm. around that, that concept here. Um, uh -huh. okay, and, good. and so, so essentially though, um, you know, the, the, the pitches come in, uh, the, the, the pitches are actually, um, then shared, uh, with the company, right? So they're present, they're actually presented. We present them, uh, to the company, uh, there is then a closed door betting session uh, with the executive teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, um, they're essentially coming up with priorities. So th this is another area where we, we kind of, when, when you, we were actually figuring about which people to assign, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to which projects and, and what makes sense, what comes out of the closed betting for us right now is, is actually a, a prior, prioritized list of, of uh, you know, projects that we want funded, pitches that okay. we want funded, right? Okay. And then there's a there's a group of engineers both on the the client teams and and the back end teams that are sort of taking part in the shape up cycle as uh, uh people to be assigned on integrated teams. Uh-huh. Mhm. Mm right? And um let's see here. Did that cover all of your initial questions on the the structure? I think so. So, so the shaping is happening from the, the that's a little bit blurry to me, but it's some mm. mix of PM and, and designers. So, right. And, and so, uh, just to call out, um, I, I had heard that, uh, so, so shapers at Basecamp are sort of dedicated to the shaping process, right? Well, we, we, we grew, we grew into that. So, um, if, if you look historically when we were smaller, I would say that the 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 shaping was a kind of um, uh, a also slightly blurry thing. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, Jason has always been the last word on on what we're going to do product wise. Um, but that sort of on the on the betting side. But he's also been one of the people who's given the most direction in terms of what we're going to do next as well. So a ton of a ton of shaping from day zero at Basecamp came from Jason. And then uh, we reached a point, we went through all kinds of, we had some awkward growth phases where it's like all of a sudden, you know, we had a couple more designers 
And then like, I was sort of in this weird in-between zone where I was doing hands-on design, but my head was more in strategy problems. And uh, we were also in a context where the strategy problems were getting a little bit more confusing than they had been in the past. And, uh, and then it started to become clear also that whenever the other designers did the work, they did a better job. <laughs> 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 so like the, 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 the degree of finesse and precision and also like front end engineering was getting higher and higher from our, from our other designers. And, um, and then they reached a point where, where Jason was kind of like, you know what, maybe, maybe it's, I, I, I like how you've been focusing on strategy and maybe you should do like more of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this didn't come until, you know, quite some time had gone by. And there was definitely a blurry period in between where, you know, we were, we were taking pitches from anyone in the company, but then it took some time to realize that actually shaping and pitching requires dedicated time and knowledge and, and expertise. And you can't just like stop programming or stop answering support requests to go shape something. Uh, cause you kind of already have a job, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, so that's, that, so we, we ended up as a, as a, as a, the way that this unfolded was that like, I, 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 I kind of centered the skills that I needed to do this. And then, and then also the company kind of grew in such a way that there was room for me to specialize in that. And, um, and now, you know, like, so Jason will do a lot of shape, like Jason does shaping, I do shaping, and then sort of depending on the project or what's going on, one of us might do more than the other in some area. I see. So, so for us, you can think of each PM having sort of that North star metric still that they're working yeah. towards, right? So there's one PM that's mostly focused on revenue, another that's mostly focused on new user experience, one on mm -hmm. uh, uh, more high level, sort of like the, the, the next thing for us. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, those, those are, those tend to be, the the areas uh, uh for their pitches but then other people may come in with with certain uh pitches or different aspects that they uh put into the bedding i see but now 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 is when it becomes a, a little interesting here because what typically ends up happening is that for the the people who wrote the pitch if your pitch gets funded you kind of become a project manager role in the execution uh, mm. of that project, okay. and so it becomes it, it becomes a little interesting here because if you are successful uh, in in getting your pitch funded, you will end up sort of carrying the torch along the way uh, uh, with the team to to help coordinate beyond beyond the the cross functional collaborators within that team. There's other folks that you need to coordinate with. Um, both on, you know, the, the marketing team on the, the data team, the experimental side and, um, and all those aspects going into it. So there's some, mm. some desire to have a role there that is sort of, uh, um, the, the focal point for all the communication and distribution from the, mm. the executing team while they're, while they're doing it. Not necessarily, mm. you know, uh, we, we're not doing the, uh, like they're they're not a project manager in that they're like writing tasks for folks. They're not assigning tasks. Yep. They're not doing any of that. Like the, yep. the people working on the problem, the individual contributors are are doing all of that work, but they they're more focused on, uh, you know, just kind of keeping keeping everybody in the know. Mm. Mm. So this is um this is interesting, and um, I'm curious. Uh, there's a certain limit to how deep we can go. Uh, in this format versus if we were just like kind of hanging out at your office, like trying, you know what I mean? Uh, getting into the super weeds of the thing. But um, uh, one thing that I kind of jumps out at me when you describe that is that it, it makes the contrast shows to me how standardized we are in our um, the design of our bets. So like in terms of the, the, res the, the way that the resources are bundled, you know, so it's like we, we, um, when we make a bet, like kind of the bet consists of a designer and one or two programmers. And I'm telling you what you already know, but just to set up the contrast, like, like you, this is like the package. You get a designer, you get one or two programmers. There's going to be some QA coming in at some point, and and that's actually all you need to build a thing. And as long as you have that, you can go build a thing and you can ship it. And then all of the shaping is actually 
it's like the shaping effort is aimed at like filling this box with mm-hmm. work, you know? And so the notion is like the, 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 you know, you could call it like a pod or a squad or whatever you call it. Like, but these, these teams that we are, that, that are going to build at base camp because they're so kind of pre-cut, like when we shape for that team, there's zero coordination that needs to happen after the fact, because you know that that team is just going to be um, in a little loop together, figuring everything out for themselves, you know? And so the, the kind of the first question, the, the questions that pop into my mind now are, are um, how is that different for you? And, and, and are there like very specialized um, uh, types of work, you know, that sometimes are needed and sometimes aren't? And, and why sort of, I'm, I'm curious, like why that um, very sort of standard team w- who just self-coordinates within themselves, like why that isn't a fit for you guys? Uh, you know, I, I think part of it is that we, we don't have, um, so, so let, let me just call out, like, um, we, we also run a lot of experiments. Uh, so experiments are, are very important to, um, the, the, the type of, uh, work we're creating and iterating on. Mm-hmm. And so with that, we have that, that becomes more of those shared resources, right? So, because we don't have enough people in those roles, so now they're they're working uh, through multiple projects. As I mm. mentioned, design uh, is is uh, you know in, in short supply, and what we end up doing with that is the the pitches that come in are actually much closer to finalized designs mm. than than uh, you know the 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 base camp uh, way. Uh. And, and so with that, it's because we don't have a designer embedded on each team. And, and similarly, as, as as I mentioned earlier, the designer is also kind of doing all the strategy and research around the things to make sure it's the right thing to fit the user problem and right. all, of, all of that stuff. Um, so so essentially, once it goes into this team, it's it's uh, now actually to stop here for a moment. Um, I think I'd heard that uh, with Basecamp, there's this concept of a point person within the team. Is that accurate? Yeah, that is accurate. Yeah, the point person is somebody who, um, uh, w- if if a difficult call needs to get made, there's a place where th- where at least it can kind of bottom out with this person. So they they're not responsible for the outcome of the whole project. They're not mm-hmm. like um, leading everybody, but they're kind of the one that everyone can go to. Like if 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 it's hard to make a decision, then a decision has to get made, and they need the confidence to know like, okay, like. You you can make that call and we can move on. I see. I see. So so we've had this aspect of um like a like an whether it would be like an eng uh, like a like a, a technical lead or or some aspect of that role within it, like who's the DRI? Who's the person I can go to that's gonna know the status of the project, regardless of which platform uh it, you know they're representing? Like they're representing the whole project, right? To say, you know, um are you are you blocked by something? Uh do we, you know, uh, do we need to um uh, are, are there are there other things that we need to be considering uh, mm. outside of that? And then that that actually gets communicated. We have we have sort of a, a company uh, level uh, meeting where it's just the leads uh, across the teams where we can kind mm. of align on the the work being done, the priorities, and and communicate that out. Like we so we have we have sort of a, a central meeting for that to take place. And rather than having everybody attend. Uh, it's essentially the the point people on on the different teams doing the work. So I'm going to make a I'm going to make a possibly useless suggestion, but this is my analytical response to like what I'm hearing. You know, from an analytical standpoint, what I'm hearing is um, we don't have enough redundancy in certain roles. We like we have like only we have too few designers or too few of this or that, and therefore we have to share resources. Because we have to share resources, we can't um, we can't reduce the interdependencies as much as we actually in, are trying to, right? And so we can't have autonomous teams, and because the teams can't be autonomous because they share resources, we have to have coordination, 
And because we need to have coordination, then we need to have uh, leads. <laughs> right. And because we have different leads showing up to some coordination, then we have to have prioritization in order to figure out how to delegate back down, like what resource gets to go where on which day. And it, it seems to me that like all of this, um, this uh, coordination um, among shared resources seems to me very expensive in terms of, uh, in terms of time. And, um, and it also seems to be like, it's probably quite expensive in terms of lost momentum. Um, because you don't get to have that thing where like, you know, you, you get in the zone in the afternoon and then the next morning you think of something and you just turn to the person on your team and mm -hmm. talk to them about it. And then you all kind of shift gears together, you know, like that, that sudden movement of like, oh yeah. Oh, okay. Boom. Like that kind of thing. Like when, when a cross-functional team has like every resource they need inside the team, that's when you can really like kind of right turn, right turn, right turn yeah. around a, pro a problem, like in the course of a week you've totally figured out something substantial. And without that, when that needs to go up to coordination, through prioritization, back down to resourcing again, in order for that problem to get solved, it turns into a month instead of a three-day thing. And what I'm wondering is, um, it, it might be, I, I have no idea what the economics look like for you all, but it it might be much cheaper to hire more people. Mm -hmm. It might be way cheaper to to hire more designers or whatever that that resource pinch is, and have the duplicates in the different teams, so the teams are more self self managing. Um, it, 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 yeah. So so may, maybe to uh, clarify one aspect of that, it, it tends not to be. It, it's more of a communication of status than it is a communication of. Uh, uh, changes and like can we get can we get buy-in to make this change to, mm -hmm. to uh so when when i mentioned the communication kind of going up and out it, it's more about status than it is um and that that meeting where i mentioned the priorities that's actually maybe less about priorities these days it was more about priorities in our uh when we had those um the, the previous cross-functional pods to make uh, sure we were all aligned. Uh, now Nowadays, it's more about uh, just communicating the status of the projects. Are we, are we still on track uh, for when we, when we think we're going to get this out rather than like uh, approval to, to make decisions. But there is one aspect of that um, that I, I'd love to dive, uh, like dive a little bit further into here, which is sure uh, at, a, at an engineering organizational level here, we do have this notion of, before we get started on a project, uh, we want to have a, a, a tech spec that aligns on the common contract that's used between the platforms, right? And, mm. and with that, uh, we also want to ensure consistency uh, and, uh, around uh, approaches and things like that. So we end up surfacing those across the engineering org to get input on, right? Mm. And, and that aspect does become... A, a blocker uh, sometimes in the way you've mentioned, because changes can't just happen between us talking because we need to make sure that, that like this is an acceptable change for multiple, te multiple people. There are ramifications within the, the system, you know, if we, if we start changing things. So, so that does become uh, that dependency of like, how do we move quickly without, uh, you know, backing ourselves into a, a corner? So is this the kind of thing, um, can we make it a little bit more concrete? This is like, if you wanted to do something on iOS, um, is it a question of to what extent this new thing you want to do on iOS has ripple effects on the other platforms in terms of like breaking things for them? Or like, what what is this, what is this alignment and this kind of uh, consistency that you're seeking? What is that about? Right. So it's about... Um... It's about defining our contract. So, so at the very like superficial level here, what are the requests and responses, right? What's the structure? Let's agree on a on a contract of when I like we're going to create a new endpoint to do this thing. When I call this with these parameters, I expect this back, and that that's just to make sure we're aligned uh, on on expectations between the platforms, right? Mm. Separate from that, there's also the concept of uh, uh, call patterns. We want consistency between the clients. Uh, it, it, as far as uh, how often we're making calls, how long are we caching things for? Um, and, and, and so there's that aspect of um, consistency. But, but similarly, there are uh, 
you know, in, depending on what the, the change is, there's uh, infrastructure needs and, and potentially database changes and things yeah. like that that need to occur. And there's a lot of people that have a vested interest in how things are set up so that it doesn't break other things. And that's that's kind of where we're aligning, uh, what we're aligning on, uh, just to make sure that we're, we're staying consistent with ourselves and we're not shooting ourselves in the foot in, in some other way. This is a hard problem. I don't think that we've solved this either. Um, I really don't. Um, uh, this thing about like managing dependencies across different platforms, this is just a really hard problem. We, we have um, minimized it as much as we can so far with I think sort of two major sort of, I don't know what you call it, like trade-offs, I guess. Um, the first is that um, we have designed ourselves in such a way that the apps are mostly hybrid apps, mm -hmm. which for us is a huge, huge productivity boost. Um, but this also means the trade-off of that is that the, 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 the phone apps are kind of downstream from the web team. Mm -hmm. And that's just, just kind of how it has to be. Like it, it, I mean, like there's ways we could play with it, but fundamentally, like there's a kind of core product team that is mostly looking at and working within the web platform. And then this is going to trickle down in terms of like, okay, now you on the mobile teams need to support this, you know? So there is this kind of sense that it's not just like, um, it can start anywhere. And now we have this sort of weird coordination problem of how to all agree. Um, it's kind of just sort of coming down. Um, but then there's this other sort of twist, which is that the um, we don't actually, at least for Basecamp, we don't actually enforce a requirement that the two apps have to have feature parity. Hmm. So we, we've we made the trade-off where we, we are willing to allow the iOS and the Android app to be different apps that do different things. And, and, and by allowing that, which is a little sometimes scary, uh, from a you know point of view of like presenting yourself to the world, you know, um, but by allowing some wiggle room there, we give the teams the possibility to try things or to innovate. And um, Android can do something that is like, oh wow, that's awesome. Um, that makes Android better and makes those customers happier um, without having the iOS team having to be on board with it. And then the iOS team could learn from that and then say, oh, we want to do that too. And then they could carry it over or the experiment could kind of fall flat and then Android could eventually replace it with something else. And then it's like, it never happened. Um, of course, there's a lot of um, boundaries that constrain the kinds of things that they can experiment with. Clearly they can't like rip up the concrete of the underlying, you know, model or uh, stuff like that. Um, and we don't, we have not, I don't believe had any cases where um, one of the mobile teams has like, built a feature to the extent that it actually puts new data in, in the database or something like that. Like we, we've never gone that far. Um, but, uh, but there have been, but there is this kind of room to be different. Um, and between those two things, we kind of have a lot of tensions and a lot of sort of things that we haven't figured out and things that are sort of constantly challenging. Uh, so I, I definitely do not want to claim at all that we, it's a solved problem. Um, but uh, the, the fact that there is this kind of general way that the water flows downhill from core product, you know, um, at least sort of sets the conversation and everybody kind of knows, like if we want to do something that we think is going to be more of a product feature, as opposed to a, um, device specific navigation thing, or, you know, then like, this is the place where that work needs to happen. That work has to happen in core product. I see. And so, so just, Curious there, uh, what is, how does experience level come into play with the folks on those teams, right? And and so like that's that's been another uh, another consideration from for us is like when we're onboarding new members and putting them into these teams, like supporting them so they get to not only understand the systems but understand sort of. Uh, uh, the, the reasons behind things. And that, that's where yeah. some of this also comes into play is like, uh, you know, how do we, how do we foster uh, uh, bringing up folks uh, within the organization, within these teams that are mostly autonomous and, and functioning? Yeah. Because you kind of need you know, like, a, like a stronger sense of direction. Yeah, I, from what I've seen, this, this particular issue has never been my direct area of responsibility. Um, 
but um, from what I've seen, um, observing how the how this has sort of played out over the years, um, what I'm seeing is actually the there's a positive feedback loop where the more autonomous the team is, and this is especially true when you when you can inject design and a designer into the team. Um, what happens is there's a lot of decision making happening inside of that autonomous unit. And when there's a lot of decision making, there's a lot of learning. Um, and so, uh, as long as we take care not to not to put two completely brand new programmers side by side on the same team, and then you, if we wouldn't want to have one designer and then two new programmers, because then there's no exchange happening. But if we've got one seasoned programmer, and they don't have to be especially senior, just someone who's been around a long time. Is knows how to make the right judgment calls more or less, and it sort of channel our way. Like yeah. you know, the, <laughs> if they've been well indoctrinated, this um, uh, we've got like the 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 one the one well well brainwashed person and the not yet brainwashed person, uh, and then and then and then by the fact that they have to sort of problem solve together in this autonomous zone, um, means that there's a super quick, super quick learning curve, um. For the for the newer person, because they are in the context, seeing how the other person, you know, uh, leads the decision making, and they have the full context of everything that's going on, and um, and and that what we see is either people um, acclimate very very quickly, um, or they also kind of get kicked out. They also kind of like like the the immune system kind of also rejects them more quickly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because they they they're given so much room to 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 move on their own as opposed to just like doing tickets and stuff like that you know so, so i think these things go together really well so uh uh with that in mind right so it, it sounds like uh you know de depending on on the the structure of the, the base camp team there the the engineers are probably working uh multiple disciplines because of the the web kind of feeding into the clients or there's some aspect there where um they're they're probably able to uh, be more unified in the, the code they change impacting both platforms in, in no, we have a, we have a very hard split there actually. Okay. So the, um, the, the, just in terms of the mechanics, the native work is so different than the web work. It's just a different stack. And, and, and especially, you know, I can't speak to Android, but I've, I've, I've looked closely enough at, at the details of iOS development that I appreciate how deep it is. Like you really have to know all those APIs and it's a whole different universe compared to the web stack. So we have, we have people who are very, very, very specialized um, in the, in, in native. And then for them, it's not, it's not a huge stretch to occasionally touch some of the web stack mm -hmm. just because the web stack is so much easier to learn. Honestly, like the rails is way more approachable than, than, than iOS development is. Um, uh, it doesn't, it do, definitely does not flow the other way. Um, yeah, we don't have any, any, any folks who are, who are like rail stack folks who are just going to go in and start tweaking something in the native implementation. That's not going to happen. So, so how would you, how would you de deal with this situation then? So, uh, a shaper comes in, shapes a, a, a pitch and says, my appetite is, uh, l let's, let's call it six weeks just for mm -hmm. ease here. It's the full cycle. Uh, and the, the team it goes to, uh, because of people available, you have, uh, you know, two, two native clients, right? Android and iOS. One is, uh, you know, fairly new. Uh, the other one has been around. So, so they, they understand at least from like how we should be doing API work and, and consistency and things like that. But then how do you take that appetite and apply it and say, well, right, for somebody who is familiar with, with this area of the app or, or the, the, the code base in general, they can get it done in six, but the, this new person is going to need a lot of support along the way. Uh, do, does the appetite ever change based on who you have available to work on it? And maybe this is a bad example because I'm using six as, as the example, but say this was a small batch project and it was two weeks, two weeks for somebody that knows exactly what they're doing, but it's going to be maybe a full cycle for somebody that's newer. How do you, how do you approach that? It's a great question. In general, um, 
uh, the, in general, we don't actually make a big difference between who's doing the work. And um, two comments to this. Um, first off, there is definitely an extreme case when we are aware of the fact that someone is particularly junior or um, or may um, or maybe we really want to get something done, but the person who's going to do it isn't as strong in, let's say, JavaScript as somebody else who might do it, but who is on vacation. You know what I mean? So there, this is this is an element at the betting table of like, well, if we could get if we could get so and so to do this, man, there's no doubt that they would be able to knock that out in a two week box. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it, it, if it was somebody else, then maybe maybe not. You know? Um, but this this aspect. Man, I hope I can explain this. This aspect is is very opportunistic. It's like, oh, we happen to have this person; they can totally get this thing done. Yep. Like that's great. Yep. Um, the the way that I prefer to think about it um, is is that um, the unknowns the unknowns in the work are way way more important than the unknowns in the performance of the individual human being. That the 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 a, a problem in the work where two things or two problems are tangled sure. is a, is a way harder problem than a lack of experience in a person. Cause if, if two things are tangled in, or if two things are tangled in, in, in the, in the work, that is a fat tailed probability mm -hmm. risk. Like, like that thing could be literally a hundred X longer than we think it is because there might be no way to untangle them. But worst case scenario, if the person is junior, what what's what's the what's the what's the shape of the tail look like? It's not going to be a hundred x longer, right? You know, what? worst case scenario, they might have to kind of tap somebody else's shoulder a little too frequently, and they might be maybe twice as long. Yeah, you know what I mean. But it's not going to be a hundred x. And so, so uh, for me, I, I much prefer to think of um, this is a. I would rather actually view basically the the available team mixes of people as teams. So the, the, the power set of like, whatever possible team memberships that I would I actually prefer to just view these as all equal, knowing that they're not, mm -hmm. but basically view them as equal, treat the, 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 what's unequal as a kind of a rounding error and put all of the attention into the clarity of the work and the interdependencies in the work. That, that makes a lot of sense because um, as you mentioned, you can always support somebody, but if there's the unknowns in, in the, the yes. work, it's a rabbit hole that you don't know. What can I add to this to figure that out? It's, um, yeah. And so, the return, the return of like fighting against someone's inexperience is, is, is awesome. Like yeah. that, like you learn by teaching them, they learn, you improve the relationship, you build trust, like all kinds of great things happen through that. But wrestling with a problem that just wasn't well scoped, like that's just burning off energy as heat. Mm -hmm. Like that's just that's just pure <laughs> friction, you know. So um, the the more that we line up the work so that the the work to be done is coherent and it's not tangled and we don't have rabbit holes in it, then then the rest is just is is going to shake itself out. Hmm. So. Uh... So, so just thinking about that, uh, in, in terms of, uh, because we're, because we're talking about experience, uh, level and, uh, and how things fit together, uh, with, with a small batch project. So, so you, you put, put them together is the idea that you're trying to keep the same people, uh, together as a integrated team for multiple small batch projects. Or is it that, you know, depending on that sort of the scheduled tetracine, that people are going to be kind of, you're going to be two weeks on this, but then you're going to be committed to this other small batch project, but you're going to be working with slightly different people, making it hard to sort of encapsulate uh, all the small batch projects into the same. Yeah. So, row. yeah. Yeah. So we, we are, uh, this is again, a case where we are willing to make trade-offs. We are willing to be suboptimal in the exact combination of people for the exact small batch project in order to be more efficient in our resource allocation process. We do not want to play calendar Tetris ever. We hate it. We just 
hate living like that. Anything that has to do with calendar Tetris is just hell for us. And we just don't want to do it. So like we, we have created a standardized cycle structure that gets us, is our escape from calendar Tetris hell. And then because of that, we are, we're, we're making the trade out to say, look, we're going to put, we're going to put people together for spans of six weeks. And then we've got potential work that's been shaped. And then we are just going to create the best fit we can between different groups of people who are together for six weeks to get to some place where we feel like we can celebrate at the end of the cycle. So do those people have some affinity beyond the cycle? Are you trying to keep certain folks together because they, they, they've built up sort of that camaraderie. They know how to work together. Is, is that an aspect that comes into play or is it purely at the sort of resourcing staffing level to say, you know what, it, it just makes sense to put these people together for this, this project. At our scale, we don't experience that. I, I don't think as a trade-off because we don't have so many people that you mm. could somehow get away from someone for too long. Mm. Um, you know, our, our core product team is on the order of a dozen people. It's not, it's not 50 or hundred or 300 people. And so for that reason, the pool is just going to keep intermixing and you can't avoid a knowledge transfer and a camaraderie and everything like that. I can, I can very much understand if you had 300 people, you would not want to be, uh, in one corner of the 300 and then in another corner of the 300 (laughs) like that, you know, every six weeks. Um, but I haven't, I haven't faced that problem myself. I see. So, so then, are you using the the same concept uh, to uh, share the knowledge about different aspects of the code base? So, so that you know how I had mentioned previously with the cross functional pods, they sort of had a focus. Let's say it's revenue. Uh, so you're kind of working on revenue related uh, features. Um, in that way, is the idea that between cycles, the revenue projects may to, may go to different folks. And yeah. that's how we're going to spread the knowledge about how revenue. Pro- my, work. my opinion is that um, these revenue versus this and that actually um, should not be different pods on the, on the construction side mm-hmm. um, because you don't have a really deep, there's not a deeply meaningful sense of like domain knowledge right. as a, as, as a builder in that side. Um, unless you happen to have some very, very, very specialized stack that's different in one area versus another. If you had an area that was extremely data intensive and, um, and then you have someone who's always integrating with some kind of data pipeline, of course, then you're in a different stack than if you're just working on a web, pi- a web stack or an iOS stack or something like that, right? But when the stacks are the same, um, my opinion is to always err on the side of having free movement of, across the surface area of, of all of that work. If it's the same stack, then you get to, you get the, the people get to work on different interesting problems. They, you get to improve your redundancy of knowledge across the code code base. The area where you need a little bit more specialization, I think is actually on the demand side, on the strategy side, someone who, if, if you want to, um, understand, if you want to like deal with some some strategic issue, you need to have a, a long continuity of trying to understand that exact same problem or following the movement of the market over time or whatever. I think I think basically you want a lot of centralization when it comes to strategy and you want as much decentralization as possible when it comes to construction. Okay. So which is kind of what we have right now as far as um, the folks doing the shaping have have essentially the the KPIs they're they're working to uh, you know uh, improve, and then once it gets down to the execution cycle, unlike our our previous pod structure, it kind of goes to to different people depending right mm-hmm. on availability and cycles and, and stuff. Yeah. How about for uh, and and I know we're over time here, so please let me know if sure if you get a run. But uh, yeah, uh, how about for the so right now the thought process is because we don't have specialized people that are doing the the user research usability testing uh we do know that you know the small small changes in our product can have big ripple effects yeah. uh and and so we we try to be very careful on the experimentation side uh which means from the design standpoint the designers are those people that are working to understand the user problems and mm-hmm. uh, do the research, which then lends itself to 
well, in order to do, say, usability testing, I got to have a, a more kind of fleshed out concept here that I'm that I'm working with. And a lot mm. of that then tends to happen before the, well, like at the time of the pitch, essentially, it it's mostly done such that because, and again, because we don't have Im embedded designers on the team, it's like, mm -hmm. that's kind of ready to go. But I know that that is very much uh, not in line with sort of how it's described in the book of the, the fat marker handed off. We, we kind yeah. of expect those designers to do the research and it's unclear whether they would be able to do that in the cycle with the, ex the the team executing on it or whether they might need their own cycle to do that it becomes weird trade-offs uh, yeah i understand I'm, yeah um if it if it if it's relevant um i think the big question here when it comes to how to integrate research is actually um it has to do with when you do research and how your research relates to building. We do not do any user testing ever. We do not do any usability testing ever. Um, and we view it as, as, as very costly and very inefficient and, and not valuable. Um, the reason is that we, um, we do so much Bef be, uh, before we deliver, before we make the bet on the design. So we, we, we put all of that research kind of energy, we move it from, from, from hypothesis verification or hypothesis validation, which is what user testing is. We thought this was going to work and now we're going to see if it was right or not. We move that all into hypothesis building. So what we want to do is we want to be we want to be so informed by users when we come up with the concept that we are extremely confident in the concept because we were soaking in user knowledge when we came up with it. This is a very, very kind of flipped world. Um, and very often um, what I see is a lot of teams have a very disorganized user research process it, into shaping. It's like kind of a pitch just comes from nowhere, more or less. And then, and then there's this sort of very weird prioritization process about something we don't fully understand. And then it's like, well, let's build it and then we'll test and then we'll know. What we want to do is we want to feel the full weight of that risk before we make the bet and say the only way we're going to know is by shipping it. And so we want to improve our understanding, our odds, our risk characteristics by having a deeper and deeper and deeper understanding in the shaping phase. So that's going to be either um, deeply understanding something because we're scratching our own itch, or it's going to be um, extensive uh, user research where we're doing interviews with customers um, and, and learning all about their current workarounds and what they're doing without this thing and what matters and what doesn't matter so that when we get to the point of actually building a concept that we're extremely, we're confident in the risk that we're taking of like, we, we think that we understand the problem and we're going to release this. Um, so because, because we have that different orientation and we're doing all the user research up front, user research lives outside of the cycles as an, as a, as a, as a, um, it's upstream from shaping. And then we never have a problem of like, well, we have to build it in order to know what to do next because the end of the ending of building is always just releasing. So I, I'm curious with that then, um, are there other aspects that come into play with, uh, so so thinking about like the the capping your downside, mm -hmm. uh, when when it comes to that, if there was something that say, um, we we know there's something here with the the pitch, we have it shaped, uh, it, it, let's um, sort of take out the design aspect right now and say we're going to do a fat marker, um, but there are aspects of that that carry risk for us because once we execute on it, uh, there's, there's certain metrics that get really, really touchy, right? You make little changes can have big ripple effects. Yeah. In I would, we would not, we would not bet on that. We would not give that to a team. We consider that to be a, like a radioactive project that we're not going to bet on. And we would say, what can we do before we make this bet to change our relationship to this to this idea so that it no longer feels like a toxic, scary um, time bomb thing. 
where like we're gonna do it, but it might screw up everything. Like <laughs> we we I know that feeling. Like I and and I've been there. You know what I mean? And we don't and we just don't want that. What we want to do is we want to place we want to um, bet on acceptable risks, risks where we say, I know the downside. I know what it looks like if this thing tanks and I'm, and I, and I am comfortable with, I'm comfortable with this tanking as a possibility. And if it tanks, like we're going to live, we're going to live to build another cycle and, and do something better or change it or, or figure something else out. But we're comfortable enough to, to ship it and expect not to touch it again, even if it doesn't quite work out the way that we hoped. Well, so it, with that, I, I guess I'm wondering whether there's some hybrid here where you're uh, essentially moving the design into the execution, but you're also uh, building it in a way where you can I experiment to turn it off if if things aren't performing or no, no, we're not we're not building it in a way to turn it off. We're also not doing that. the 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 thing is that I think. Um, we, we, uh, we are, we, we insist on a better theory of what we're doing before we bet. Mm. We, we have to have a stronger theory of why this is a good idea and why we think it's going to work. And this whole thing of like, I think a lot of teams today are very accustomed to this idea of like, well, we don't really know and we'll never know. So we just have to build it to find out. We don't live in that world. We don't think that that's, um, we think it's our job to know, to have a, we can, I mean, you can never actually know until you ship. Mm -hmm. But um, so we're, 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 of course, humble in that regard, but we, we feel responsible to have a theory of, of, of the thing that we're building, of why it's going to work and what goes wrong if it doesn't work and whether that's an acceptable risk for us. I see. And do you think, do you think that that concept is, is broadly applicable across, um, uh, uh, companies and uh, markets. And Absolutely. I, I asked this just curious because Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we're I think we're spoiled in the software world because we got so used to the idea that we can just change everything. It, no hardware company thinks like that. No hardware company says, yeah, they might ruin everything, but we'll just ship it to find out and then we'll test it with users. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you if if the if the full bet is too scary, then you you have then you need to do prototyping. So, for example, um, when I when I designed the hill chart feature, um, I was terrified of the idea of, of, of like deploying it in Basecamp. <laughs> uh, I thought like this thing is crazy; nobody's going to understand it. Um, it's going to like complicate the product, and I don't even know if anybody's going to want to use it. And then I'm going to look like the biggest fool because like here was this like thing that I invented that like nobody uses. And it, we were like, and, and you know what I mean? Like, this is not at all what I wanted. And I, I, um, I, so the, for me, the idea that we would like build a hill chart into base camp was, a, was, a, was in my mind, but I was, I did not go to Jason and David and say, Hey, can we go, can we do this? Here's an idea. I'm going to pitch this. That was not at all what happened. Um, because to me it was too risky. So, but, um, so then the question was, what can I do to learn that has a different risk profile? And um, this was where prototyping comes in. So like I, I, built a, uh, I built a spreadsheet actually in numbers that is a fully functioning hill chart. Um, I, I, it's kind of amazing that numbers can do this, but it can. Like it, it even renders a curve and it moves bubbles along the curve with some very simple input. And you can add scopes and, and, and specify a different X value for their location. And then it perfectly renders the chart. And, um, and I, I worked with, uh, with one of our teams and said, hey, would you be willing to, to try to populate this at the, uh, every few days as you make progress on your scopes? And, uh, and Connor, who is one of our designers, was like, hey, this is cool. I'm totally down for trying this. And he updated that spreadsheet nearly every day, took a screenshot and posted it to the check-in in Basecamp. And this was how um, I got the confidence to be like, wow, this is a thing. Like, this is viable. Like, I can totally see now what this would, how this would work if it were in place um, without taking that risk of having, having to actually build the whole thing. And I think this is um, always an option. So we don't have to have, like, we do nothing or we have full confidence. There's a range of prototyping possibilities, you know, or sometimes it's research possibilities. There's other projects where, I had an inkling that maybe we should do something 
And then I, I decided to go do a, a recruit 10 interview subjects. And then by talking to people, I either became confident that it was worth doing or threw the idea away because it wasn't resonating with anybody. And um, there's a lot of stuff we can do, I think, up front. Do, um, so, so let's see, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in knowing then, like, are there aspects like, without getting into, you know, the specific of the, the base camp products, but I, I'm wondering if yeah. there's aspects to the projects then that are dynamically configurable in ways that allow for, uh, um, like like more of a playground atmosphere. Like are, are there aspects of of the products that that uh, allow you to um, uh, test different hypotheses like that uh, within within the app itself? Mm, we we don't we don't do anything like feature flags. Okay. Yeah. Um, in in very extreme cases, we will sometimes. Um, We never do feature flags for customers. We have on occasion built things that we would allow ourselves to try in the actual app um, uh, that wouldn't be exposed. But I, I honestly, like, even then, it's extremely rare in 17 years that I can think of any cases where we shipped something to production that was behind a feature flag. Very, very rare. Hmm. Yeah. Building is expensive. This is the fundamental viewpoint yeah. that we've always had. Building is expensive and building is hard. And we don't want to do it unless we, we have a really strong theory behind the thing that we're going to build. And um, also, you know, the other thing, um, I don't know if this is a factor or not, but because Jason is the one making the bets um, and Jason is the last word and, 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 and the biggest owner in the company, um, there's more latitude to be wrong. He, he he's willing to be wrong and he's quite humble about about how much he knows but if he has an instinct that he thinks this is the right thing to do and he's willing to make that bet it's it's they're his resources to bet you know and um, we don't have so many ripple effects in base camp we're we're not doing wildly crazy things to the onboarding flow you mm -hmm. know what i mean um uh um so there isn't there is a question to sort of the orthogonality of the new thing you're introducing and 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 all of that but um uh, but that's also a factor is like, there's, there is a sense of like, this thing might not work. It's possible. Nobody will use it. It might be the wrong thing, but back to capping the downside, is it going to sink us if it's wrong or, or are we going to learn, you know? And, um, and his mentality that I've observed, uh, has always been, he would rather err on the side of, of trying something and learning as long as he's sure it's not going to sink the ship by trying it. That makes that makes a lot of sense. I th I think there there's aspects of that to sort of uh, uh, un unwind and and sort of going back to you know how you talked about de dependencies and uh, you know allowing teams to function more autonomously. It, it, yeah. it comes those connections between things yeah. here that that really limit the constraints or or they introduce the constraints and you see the downstream effects and yeah. you're trying to trace it back and saying well what is it that that's you know causing causing these things. Yeah, it's a hard thing to talk about, but I think it's very much at the center of how we are making decisions is sort of what's tangled together, what's independent, kind of where can we, where is it a straight shot where it's kind of like bumper bowling? And <laughs> and when is it, you know, when is it like everything is going to start having ripple effects that we can't foresee? And it's mm -hmm. very much about can we channel, we have some idea, can we channel that idea to the point where it more or less seems to be a straight shot implementation wise? And it's not going to tangle in with other things, and we're going to survive if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, so slightly, slightly off off topic from that, but I'm curious, you know, because I'm I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking of then also about this sort of uh, the this treadmill that our our shapers seem to be on at the moment, which is mm. that they're they're shaping, and then they also when execution starts, they kind of have one foot in the boat uh, with the the execution team, but they're also working to shape the next thing. Yeah. What is what is uh, what is the cool down look like for non engineers? What what are non engine like 
what are Nana engineers doing during the cool down period? It's very clear, sort of like that break for folks, but it seems like potentially for, for shapers, uh, especially if the bedding's going on and like during that time, like, like there's other stuff happening. And I, I guess I'm, I'm curious whether like we're trying to get to a place where that everybody enjoys some aspect of a cool down. So they don't feel yeah. like they're tied from one thing to the next. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that until we untangle that knot of, well, you're, you're going to have one foot in the boat of the execution team. Like that's a, that's a, you know, it, it, it drains people. Yeah. I'm going to make a jump and, and I have a theory and I might be very wrong, but I'm just going to make an attempt here. My guess is that um, the shaping work that's going on doesn't have a strong enough theory of what this is and why it works and what it is and what it's not. My guess is that um, your shaping, your pitches that you're doing are more um, intent than they are end to end theory of like, we will do this and this will be the result. Um, I think it, it sounds like it's a little bit more like we're going to do this, but then we're going to sort of figure out along the way and we're going to test and then we're going to decide. And it's like, um, they don't feel closed to me. And, and the fact that they're not kind of closed, this is the opportunity. This is what, this is what plugs the hole. When the hole is plugged, this is going to happen. And this is why we believe we're going to do it. Let's go do it. I believe the fact that it's not closed is why the shapers are getting sucked into the execution process because actually the shaping kind of isn't over and 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 you're you're kind of you're actually doing shaping inside of the execution by making important decisions about how to proceed or when to turn left and when to turn right. And if if the shaping were were had a stronger um, theory in it, then you would just hand it over to the team and say, look, you you have everything you need to know. Uh, do your best, and then if if you if you need me, once every three weeks or two weeks to do a demo or walk through some random hard thing, no problem. Um, but having an ad hoc session, you know, on week four because some weird confusing thing came up, uh, is very different than kind of having a foot in the whole time, you know. Mm. So so the the world the world that that um that I, that I want to be in um is um. I am I'm shaping something that embodies my understanding of problem and solution. And then I'm gonna walk this through with another person. And that other person is gonna be like, oh, I totally get it. I get why we're doing it. I get how, how it solves it. I get what the main moving parts are. I get why we're leaving those things out. Like, I get it, I get it. I'm gonna go do it, I get it. You know, that's, that's, what, the, that's what kickoff should feel like. And when kickoff feels like that, as a shaper, you you get to go ah, like okay, what am I going to do next while they're building? And um, this is now now you as a shaper can feel a little bit more like the engineers feel in the sense that like you have your work and your work has an output and you kind of ship it, and then you get to walk away from it. Like so, for me, like if a pitch is going to get built, that's kind of like shipping the pitch. And like I, I'm going to be interested in how it goes, and I'm and I'm going to support the people as much as I can. But I should only need to be I should be a very special, extremely laser laser tactical uh, consultant, like once or twice in the course of the cycle. You know, I don't want to be needed more than that. Um, and uh, and then and then then the cool down becomes very easy to explain because it's like during the six weeks. I am I am really working hard to understand the problems and shape solutions and make packages of problem and solution that are hand offable, and uh, and then and then everyone is building. Everyone else who's in the build teams is building during the six weeks, and then in cool down, I'm gonna write I'm gonna write my heartbeat of um, this is these are the things that I researched. These are the things that I shaped. These are the things that I'm still working on. Whatever they're going to write their heartbeat of like, here's what we shipped and how it went and blah blah blah, and uh, and we more or less are having the same kind of a cool down experience. So so that um, there's some interesting insights there in that. Um, so so while I think the, the there is definitely a tie between the the shaper the the fact that we're doing experimentation they're they're connected to this thing throughout the you know until it ships and until they get the readout 
to, to yeah. learn from it, right? So they're they're kind they're they're tied in that way. They're they're not really tied in the way of uh, changing or making decisions along the way. I feel like the the pitches themselves are uh, well shaped in that the team can execute, and it's kind of when they get to the execution phase where they actually take off their shaper hat and put on their project manager hat. That like a more traditional project management, okay, I'm going to communicate here. Or we're going to check in on status, make sure people are unblocked, uh, you know, like that kind of role. And mm. I, I think that kind of gets to the, like, to the, why do we need that? Like, wh why is it as a, yeah. as a, as a team, we need that. And yep. like, like, obviously we're, we're experiencing something where like, uh, uh, something's missing without it. There, there's, uh, and, and we've kind of seen this in projects that uh, do well, and I'm, uh, I say do well, not in uh, like the outcome of the, yep. of the project, but did they ship the thing? Did they yeah. ship it on time? And the one, yeah. and, and we've had problems where, where there, there's a misfiring and it, it seemed like, okay, we the, like, there's some project management aspect to this we, we're inserting and it's helping, but, but uh, it goes back to, that's what's causing people to kind of be tied in along the execution cycle here. Uh, mm -hmm. after shaping mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think there's some uh questions coming up there about um what's going on with the uh resource allocation that requires that coordination yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i i think part of this also is is just when adopting something like this uh uh you know we're all kind of trying this at the at the same time here and and so we don't necessarily have the the learnings to to say to the team, okay, here's what's going to you know really work well for you, and and you're going to encounter these things, and and here's things uh, you know to overcome those obstacles, and we don't want to just kind of like let them go and say, hey, we've introduced this new process, now you're supposed to all you know work closely together, be sure to collaborate, talk frequently, you know, over overcome challenges, and and so. We're, we're trying to, you know, because uh, uh, new folks join the team, new people get put on like into these areas and we want them to be successful and we want to make sure they're prepared. And I think there's some aspect of that, which is uh, uh, guidance, but it's also like uh, potentially overreaching and in, in affecting the autonomy uh, of that yeah. team, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a, um, there's, there's a, there's a big difference between, um, you know, thinking of autonomy as an effect and thinking of, of, of how do you cause autonomy? Because sometimes people say, well, we, we need the autonomy in order to just trust the team. But then there's an aspect to which you actually have to trust the team to create the autonomy, you know? Yeah. And um, uh, uh, a big part of this, I think, is um, uh, in trusting the team, not only entrusting, but just giving them the responsibility. Like, here, your shoes just got bigger, you know? And um, you have a you have a fixed amount of work. Well, no, you have a, you have an unknown amount of work actually because of the, the variable scope. But you have a you have a fixed amount of time. We've shaped the work, and and we believe that you are capable of coming up with a solution. This is on you, right? But then, the fact that we have some um, uh, other aspects of how the company is organized are are helping us because, for example we don't have regularly scheduled meetings across the company, mm -hmm. which means that if I need to, to if, if I'm stuck and I need help from some senior programmer, I can just tap their shoulder and they're not going to tell me, sorry, I have meetings all day. They're going to say, how's three o'clock, you know? And, and so what happens is we, we're, we are reserving capacity all the time to, to deal with the unexpected, to help each other, to answer each other's questions, uh, that that time is actually there, and so they're they're kind of on their own in the sense of like you're responsible, you're the team, but at the same time, like it's not this impossible thing to tap somebody's shoulder and get and get a look at it or get some input or get some help or or, or whatever like that. I think that's actually a, a a maybe like a very important point that's easy to miss, you know, because if everyone's schedule is wall to wall all the time. And then you're supposed to be doing something right now. You're very alone. Mm -hmm. um, versus if you feel like you can tap shoulders and it's going to be fine. That's a that's a very very different environment. Yeah, uh, those are those are uh, great points. I, I feel like 
uh, one, one thing I, I think about often is what does this look like to scale up? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so right now we, we probably have two or three tracks at the same time in a cycle, mm -hmm. right. A, a, mm -hmm. You know, it is being worked on and, uh, yeah. And any, it, like kind of, it, it's kind of easy to see what you want to happen, but it's, it, it's not necessarily clear, like what actions am I going to take? That's going to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, provide that at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and like, like you said, sort of cultivating that, that, uh, autonomous team nature, uh, is the thing that, that allows you to just add more people to more tracks and not have, um, and, and not have, uh, weird overlaps and cycles and, and people that are wearing so many hats that, uh, you know, they're getting burned out and, and things yes. of that nature. This is uh this is a really important thing. I think if we really internalize that leadership leadership trust and autonomy are all effects not causes everyone always treats them as causes we need to have trust to do x we need to have leadership to do x and it's the opposite like if i do x then it will lead them if i do x they will trust me if i do x they will be autonomous like that it's that's worth i think really putting a lot of um energy and focus into because that's when we can start to to put the mechanisms in place that create the outcomes that we want. Hmm. That's that, that's great. I'm 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 looking down to see if there was anything else uh <laughs> uh that that uh you know we didn't we didn't touch on um I actually I I guess I I'm just I'm just curious uh is there anything that any consideration that went into the infrastructure at the code level to support these autonomous teams working together. Because something that is always on my mind is how do we scale up the infrastructure of the iOS uh, platform so that we mm. can get more folks working on it at the same time and it's not going to have weird side effects uh, uh, that that people that essentially becomes those rabbit holes where where we discover along the way that two things are connected that shouldn't be yep. and makes it hard yep. to work. Is there work uh, that that Basecamp did in preparation for allowing folks to work more in parallel? Yeah, um, uh, I can speak to this from my days of when I used to be very close to the code hand hands on. But this was always in the in the web stack. I don't know if there's differences in the iOS stack, but I'm going to assume that the key, that the core principles translate. Um, uh, since since day zero, ba David was always extremely insistent on every code piece of code that he worked on himself, and every piece of code that ever got committed to master that um, that it met certain standards of style and readability and and um, and 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 what do you call it? Well factoredness. Um, uh, and this has been a extremely prominent, um, visible, and regularly enforced and upheld value within our programming team since then. Um, and um, David has always upheld that as sort of the most senior person in the programming side. And then our the people that I think of that I know from the early days of working closely with like Jeff and Jeremy and Sam, like I am blown away when I look at their code still. And I think it's beautiful. And um, the, the thing that's so beautiful about it is the fact that there are clear strands, you know, everywhere. And um, sometimes you have to scratch your head when you first go in there, but then you follow the string and it doesn't just lead to some tangle somewhere, there's an end. And you're like, oh, that's what that does. And you follow this string, you're like, oh, that's what that does. And you're like, oh, this abstraction is leaning on that abstraction. Ah, okay, I get the pattern. We keep using that over and over again. Like there's this, this quality of being well-factored, the same quality that we were talking about at the org level, reducing the dependencies between teams and resource allocation. I think that this, this, this aspect of um, interdependence and orthogonality and um, having clear different responsibilities for different parts and everything like that. This is fundamentally just an enabling mechanism for anybody to reason about any system. And, and we, we always take the assumption that, that um, 
either either my future self will forget everything or somebody who's new to the company tomorrow will work on it. That's the point of view. And this traces back completely to um, you know the culture of extreme programming and Kent Beck and Martin Fowler and those folks. This this aspect of our culture comes from there, and um, I, it's it's extremely important because if your code is spaghetti, then um, then anytime you even try to shape a project, everything that you think is going to be straightforward is going to turn into a huge yak shave, you know, mm-hmm. um, and um, so actually, the ability to reason about the system is what enables us to be strategic about change. And 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 shaping and pitching is a is a is a company process to define change. You know, and so this is like these totally go together for sure. I don't have any special insight about how to get there. Um, that's more like David and the programmers area, mm-hmm. but 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 it's definitely a very important enabling factor. Well, that's a fantastic explanation. Thank you so much for the context on that. Um, mm. uh, we, we recognize it's important too, and that, but it, it becomes a, a question of, uh, uh, you know, like the the value of of focusing on that versus other uh, other things to be focused. Exactly. On. If if it's if it's framed as an aesthetic issue of like, well, we all like to have good style, and we all like to have code that is a certain way. That's a very different question than like, if this code is not well factored, we won't be able to shape a project next year. Mm-hmm. That is a that is something that goes right up to the executive level in terms of like our whole ability as an organization to turn the wheel. You know, it's it's not an engineering concern; it's a company wide concern. And then it goes, and then it if if it takes that extra time to review that pull request. Or it takes that extra time to 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 tear up a piece of code because someone senior said no way, like we've got to do it like this instead. Then that time is going to be experienced as being well spent because the return that you get on the second and third orders into the future is your ability to to onboard mm-hmm. people and to, to 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 do different changes and stuff like that. Yeah, that that's fantastic. Um... Ryan, that is, I, I think I've gotten to every aspect here that I wanted to ask you questions. Oh, great. On. Is, is, there, is there anything else, though, that uh, um, that that you wanted to cover uh, for, for learning for other folks? Um, uh, all of your questions already are the exact kind of things that I want to cover, because I can never predict what the questions are. I don't know what is valuable to, to elaborate on. And... Um, um, I'm very happy with all the stuff that came out of this. So for me, it was already very valuable too. So I'm really pleased. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity here. This has been yeah, thanks. A, absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much for being willing for, you know, like being willing to go in public and have the conversation instead of just one-on-one too. So then we can also, I'm sure a lot of folks will get a lot out of it. So yes. cool, man. All right. Yeah. Best of luck. And thanks a lot for, for, right. for being on. Take thank care. Thank you so much. Take care. Yeah. Bye-bye. See ya.